think of service, or missionary work, or anything like that, a verse that usually comes to mind, or a saying that usually comes to mind is that saying, or that verse out of Isaiah that says, here am I, send me. I'm sure all y'all heard that before. Here am I, send me. And that's that's a noble thing, and that's a thing to, to strive for. But we we must realize that a lot happens before that, and that and that vision that Isaiah had. There, there was a lot that went on uh, before he was able, from his heart, to genuinely say, uh, "Here am I, send me." And I'm not going to go through all of it, but just one one of the biggest key words I, I want to point out. I've been talking about this. Uh, for the last week or so, so y'all guys bear with me. I know y'all been hearing this, but I, I believe it's very important. He, he said, I saw, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, uh, lofty, exhausted in the train, in his robe filling the temple. Uh, that was key. He was able to see. He saw the Lord for what he was in all of his glory. That was key, and that's what led uh, to the next steps. Another verse says, verse uh, 5, it says, For my eyes have seen the King and the Lord of hosts. So I want to go to the New Testament now with that same, same theme and that same, same type of word. And now we're with Jesus in, in Matthew 9, 36. Jesus come through the town and it said, He saw the people. He saw, Jesus saw the people. And, and, and he felt compassion. He felt compassion for them because they were distressed. And they were dispirited like, like sheep without a shepherd. The, this word saw, it, it, it's a, getting the full knowledge of something when you see it. It's not just a glance. It's not just a, oh, by the way, I've seen that go by. But it's seeing and perceiving and understanding and even experiencing uh, the, the whole situation that's in front of you. Uh, it's being able to feel. And if you notice, there's always an action after that word. I saw and then something moved. I saw and it's all through the New Testament. Almost 500 times uh, this word is used, the same type of word. Another place is uh, Luke, the Good Samaritan. We've heard that. It says he saw him and he felt compassion. Same thing. He was able to see him, and then there was a reaction right after that. He saw him. He felt compassion. He made a move. Go over to Luke. Luke uh, 17. Jesus again, the ten lepers. He healed the ten lepers. Uh, let's see, verse 17, starting in verse 14. It says, when he saw them, he, be, he being Jesus, when he saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priest. And you, you, they were going and they were cleansed. Now one of them, when he saw that he had been healed, he turned back, glorifying God with a loud voice. And he fell on his face. And at his feet, giving thanks to him, and he was a Samaritan. And then Jesus answered, were there not ten of you? Were there not ten of you cleansed? But the nine, where, where are they? Was no one found who returned to give glory to God except for this foreigner? Ten, ten guys, ten outcasts, ten guys with diseases, ten guys uh, that were not supposed to be around people, ten write-offs, ten... Losers, ten, whatever, fill it, in, fill it in, fill in the blanks. Ten guys Jesus saw. He'd seen their situation. He'd seen their pain. He understood it. He perceived it. And he healed them. And then what did they do? They left. He gave them a command. He said, go see the priest. So they were obedient. They did go along and they, they, they went to see the, the, the priest. And then they saw. It says they saw. They're healing. Same word. Same exact word. They saw. But out of them ten, only one of them actually seen it for what it was worth. The others took their healing. They went on about their business. I'm sure they had agendas. 
I'm sure they had family. I'm sure they had stuff going on. I'm sure they had careers. They had this, that. They had things they wanted to do now that they were healed. They got all this stuff back. They, they saw their healing and they, they seen it just as the healing and they took off. They went about their way. Nine of them did. But the one saw past the healing. We talked about this in class the other day. He seen past the healing. He got the healing. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I got my wife back. I, I got this back. I got my probations over with. I got healed from this. I got healed from that. I, I got my life great. I got salvation. Yeah, I got, I'm blessed. Yeah, I got it. I, I see that. But he's seen it for what it was worth. He's seen who it came from. He's seen the whole picture. He was able to see past the gift. And he was able to see the giver. And any time that we do that, there's an action. There's an action. You can't fake that. You can get up here and teach. You can do all you want. But you can't fake that internal move of compassion. So my prayer, I've been kind of looking at this, is that I could see. Lord, give me some vision to be able to see what's going on. Lord, show me what you're doing. And then give me the courage and the spirit and the drive to then move afterward. And so... I ask that you join me uh, in that prayer. I think it's a good prayer for all of us. Uh, but here at the program, Liberty Lodge, we have, have a whole a little section there, a whole commitment, uh, a, a whole, basically another program set out for that one that gets their healing, gets their, their ducks in a row, gets all their toys back, gets their parents talking to them again, gets all that, but sees something a little different and he wants to turn back the leper turned back so we have a spot to help them and to cultivate and to bring out the best of their willingness and their obedience and their ability to see it for what it's worth and help them give back as a servant just as Jesus came to be a servant so it's called servant leadership training it's a six-month commitment uh, the main spot for that commitment is the house man, which runs the house over there. And so they're the go-between between pastor, me, and the house. Let me tell you, that's a hard spot. You ever heard it runs downhill? That's where it runs, to the house man. The house man doesn't get to sleep. The door's always being knocked on. Everything's his deal. He's got all the problems of the sheep. And he's in between. It's a hard hard spot, but it can it can bring, how many of you know some good oil can come out of a crushing? <laughs> Chad, why don't you come up and tell us about this uh, six-month SLT commitment here at Liberty Lodge. Let's give Chad a minute. Thank you, Lance. Well, uh, it's really nothing short of a miracle that, that I'm alive today, that I'm standing it's nothing short of a miracle that uh, I made it through the phase one program and graduated that. It's nothing short of a miracle that I uh, made it through my houseman commitment uh, and graduated. Can you believe I'm up here, Crawford? That's six months. You're next. But uh, so many times, actually, let me back up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna open This is Isaiah 43, uh, starting at verse 18. Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall you not know it. I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. So I remember walking in the doors here broken, defeated, uh, coming here for, for really all, all the wrong reasons. Um, the woman I was with gave me an ultimatum, uh, and I was also deep back in my addiction and knew I needed help at the same time, but the uh, main reason I came here was for that woman to try and fix that. 
but I also wanted to get clean. Um, <clears throat> so through through my phase one program, as it says in the uh, in the scripture I just read, uh, forget the former things, the things of old. And when I came in, uh, I was holding on. I was holding on to all that stuff, my past, uh, the shame and the guilt, um, my wife being out there alone, um, my addiction, all the people I've hurt, all the people I've manipulated, all the people I've stolen. <coughs> um, <clears throat> I was holding on to all that, um, and it was really keeping me from uh, working my program to, to its full potential. But God, uh, God had other plans for me. Uh, he moved me uh, fairly quickly into a, a leadership spot, a lead man position. And that's when I finally started to uh, get my, my sense of purpose back, uh, motivation, and uh, really started believing in myself again. And uh, so from there, graduated the program, I moved into SLT, felt calling uh, to serve, I saw the need for help, and uh, the SLT was, was the, one of the hardest things I've ever done, <clears throat> mainly because I'm, I'm, I'm a very, I was a very selfish, uh, arrogant, self-righteous person, and uh, I didn't know what it meant to serve others. I knew what it meant to be a tyrant. I knew what it meant to uh, tell people what to do. Um, but I, I didn't know what serving others looked like. And it really, it really uh, changed my outlook and uh, I believe uh, changed me. Really glad there were so many times that that I wanted to quit. So many times I wanted to quit, and uh, I'm just really glad uh, that I stuck it out and didn't quit. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see what the Lord has next for me. Um, so, anyways, I. I'm going to stop making this about me right now. Mom, Dad, would you mind coming on up here? I know you didn't want to, Mom, but I have to do this. <laughs> These are the, the, the guys with the real testimony right here. My poor parents. Mama, Rose, my dad, Carl. Ah, uh, I put I put these two uh, through uh, hell on earth, hell on earth to say the least. Um, <clears throat> the anguish that you guys have went through uh, because of my. choices I've made uh, far outweigh anything that I've ever gone through. And uh, you guys have stuck with me and you've had my back uh, through all of it. We've had, yeah, we've had our rough patches, but um, <clears throat> you guys have always been there for me. And I, I just really appreciate you guys. And, um, I wanted to take this time to honor my mother and my father. a lot of that and uh, I'm just grateful that uh, you, know, you guys are, are still around and uh, you're here to, to see God moving in my life and uh, to 
to see me be successful. And I know that uh, you guys have a lot of peace in that. And uh, knowing that um, brings me brings me a lot of peace. So uh, I know I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. be doing next, I, I talked with Lance, and I've, I've, I've seen the need for help here at this ministry. It's a small, uh, it's a small ministry uh, run, run by really all, all the guys, and uh, um, I want to I wanna help. So whatever that looks like, uh, that's what I want to be stepping into, is helping out around here and uh, moving forward. So I'll be here for a while. Uh, love you guys. to everybody here. It's, um, like he said a couple of times, it's short of a miracle that we're here, that he's alive. Um, and we're just very grateful and the power of prayer. We just never give up. You have a, you have a pretty powerful testimony yourself. Would you share that with the church? Yeah, I was diagnosed with um, cancer in July. Great trouble, 
times it'll be hard, hard to deal with and hard to bear up under. How I many you know we're there, aren't we? We're in a very high anxiety world today. Matthew 25, Matthew 6, 25 and 26. Jesus is talking about an antidote for this. Apparently they had a hard time back then too with high anxiety. So Jesus is addressing them just like I'm addressing you today that uh, we're going to have anxiety. That's just the way it is. But how we deal with anxiety is the real key. And we have to learn how to deal with this anxiety in a health way. We, you know, it's not okay to have a meltdown and kick the dog and punch the wall and then say, oh, it's just the way I am. You know, we've, we've got a testimony out there about how we deal with life. And, and we, Christians of all people, should be uh, setting an example of how to deal with anxiety. We've all got the same stuff going on, some at different levels. Anyway, Jesus addresses and says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life. The Amplified says, do not be perpetually uneasy or stop being perpetually uneasy, anxious, or worried about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to put on your body and wear. Is not life greater in quality? Are there things that are not far more important and excel above it? We got a lot of, we got, we got bigger fish to fry out there today. <laughs> we got bigger things on worrying about where we're going to eat, what we're going to drink, and what we're going to wear. Some people get so stressed out today just about what they're going to wear today. <laughs> you know, having to make a decision, having hangs a high anxiety about that. But Jesus is not forbidden being having worry or being anxious because you know that's the way life is. We have to be concerned, you know. But he's talking about the sinful part. He's not forbidding you know, just the emotions of it. But he's forbidding the sinful part of where we get excessive and obsessive and compulsive. I mean, I don't know what OCD is. Get wrapped around the axle, bent out of shape. He's talking about this perpetual, ongoing anxiety that we have that keeps us from being able to do what, what we need to do. Uh, we, you know, people talk about control. Uh, you know, control for you. Know, let me tell you, but you better be in control of your life. <laughs> you know, if you're not, I mean, that's part of our problem in our addiction. Any guy who, we, who aren't in control. So there's nothing wrong with what we call healthy control. I mean, we've got to pay the bills. We've got to take care of our health. We've got to be concerned. We've got to deal with these things, but we can't get so overly concerned and get have a high anxiety to the point where it becomes sinful. Jesus goes on and says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow nor reap or gather in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more important than a bunch of birds? Birds. Birds of the air. I've been having a beef with birds. I decided when I moved to my got my new place so that I was going to learn how to raise up palm trees. So I learned how to get the seeds and how to clean them and get the right time and how to germinate them and had my first batch ready. I germinated for three weeks. They were hurt, finally sprouting and I put them in all these little things and set them out there and came back two days later and, and the birds had eaten every single one of them. So I went to Walmart and I bought me a nice Air rifle, you know, nice gold plated thing. Word got out on the street pretty quick. The birds disappeared for some reason or another. So I thought I had done with, dealt with the birds, and so anyway, I've been uh, a little smarter now, working a little smarter, not harder. And I bought me this mesh and learned to cover them up, so I hadn't had any more problems. So I hadn't seen no birds. Then I decided I want to progress to oak trees. So I've been looking for oak tree seeds to make oak tree, you know, nice. Uh, but I found out they only fall one time a year, and that's about now. So I've been waiting, waiting, waiting for oak trees. So uh, I went around all over town trying to find oak tree seeds, and I realized the birds done already ate them. <laughs> Here, you know, missed my window. 
Remember, I'm over in Orlando and I'm eating. I walk into a place over there and all of a sudden I see acorns everywhere. He's play. I said, how in the world? But it was in a, a, a business area where there was obviously no birds. So, and I picked up like a hundred of these babies. And uh, bought them back home and read up on them, germinated them, got them ready to go, planted them, you know, did all that. And doggone it if I didn't come back and them birds had crawled under the mesh, ate every one of my seeds and just a big hole in every one of them. My OCD kicked in. Couldn't get the birds off my mind. Trying to pray and spend time and for three hours and birds were in my head and, and eat my lunch. Tapping into my control issues. So I could hear them birds talking about me. So this time I went and got my AR-15. Um, I think we've taken care of the bird problem. But how silly. You know, God, God, you know, Birds are birds. Birds don't worry about what they're going to eat, what to drink. We do. We're, we're the only people that get uptight, get out of shape, have any panic attacks, things like meltdowns over some silly birds. And I had to laugh. The Lord said, "What have you been preaching on, man? You know, here are these little things are up in my head, ruining my joy and taking my quiet time. And I finally just, I had to get over it. I had to let it go. You know, I know it sounds silly, but I know nobody else has a problem with those kinds of things. So anyway, the birds are there. So. But the point is, uh, you know, the serenity prayer says, God grant me the serenity, that inward disposition to accept the things that I cannot change or control. Give me the courage to change that I think, the things that I can, the wisdom to know the difference. You know, we got to get okay. We have to learn how to, how to be concerned and deal with things, but not get overly sinful. We have to learn how to handle our stress and do things, and we got to turn it over. Philippians 4, 6 through 7 says, Be anxious about nothing, overly anxious, sin, don't have high anxiety about anything, but instead <clears throat> do something different, work a little smarter, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let those requests be made known to God and turn it over in the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So I had to turn my birds over to the you know what I'm saying? And to turn that over to the Lord and let it go. But it's that way with all of us. We're, all, we're going to have these times. And we've got to learn how to work smarter and not harder. Instead of worry, 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 we need to just start learning how to pray, 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 turn things over to the Lord. God is God. God's in control. He's big enough. He can handle things. And we need to learn to work together with the Lord, don't we? I'll do my part, be concerned, take care of my job, and turn the rest over the things that I can't change, turn it over to the Lord. Let it go and God's peace uh, will come. So we have to have that serenity. And that's why we pray this prayer. Lord, let me accept that thing. I mean, it, to, to, to be okay with the things I can't control. Let me change the things I can. And then give me the wisdom to do the difference. That's powerful. Let me, let me know. So let me ask you, can you be okay with where you are today, with whatever's going on, on the way to where you're going? God cares much about how we're waiting than what we're waiting for. You know, sure, God wants me to have palm trees and oak trees. It's kind of makes sense, but He's more concerned about, about that. You know, so a little lesson for me to learn, but it's big, it's huge. You know, about about things. If God cares about those little birds. How much more does He care about all of us? So we've got to learn how to take things over. So, can you? Be okay today with what's going on in your life, with your marriage the way it is, your finances, your health. Can you be okay with things that aren't quite the way they are without having to, to be, be concerned, without being overly sinful and having a meltdown over these things? Some things we just got to let it go and move on. And it's hard. You know, OCD. I remember dealing with my OCD one time. I'm sitting right here and somebody had reaped a plant on the stage. And I was like the whole time, right in the middle of worship, I'm, I'm, I'm up here ready, almost ready to go up here and move this plane around, and I'm going like, man, what are you? Right then I realized, man, I'm sick. I mean, that's a problem. So I had to start right then to say, no, 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 no. I'll get it during the offering time. <laughs> but anyway, we've all got stuff like that, don't we? 
So the point is, we're, we're, we're supposed to be lights under the world, salt of the earth. We're supposed to be representing God. We're supposed to be handling these difficult times in a better. So I don't know about you, but I'm trying to learn how to work a little smarter and less harder. Let's turn this morning to 1 Timothy chapter 6, 6. The secret of contentment. The secret of contentment. When people talk about a secret, hey, man, let, me take, let me let you in on this little secret. What they're trying to say is, I know something you don't know. I know something that other people don't know, but I'm going to let you in on it because it will help make your life better. We talk about, we talk about the keys of success. Today we want to talk about what the ancients, Stoics and the philosophers, uh, you know, used to uh, have believe in certain character qualities or attributes that were uh, just, you know, that they, they, that's what they pursued. You know, their, their way of, of uh, was not what they knew so much. A lot of them was about by how they acted and you know, their, their character, meanness, how they handled situations, how they operated under pressure. Meanness is the ability to handle things exactly the way you need to every single time, the way you're supposed to. Wouldn't that be wonderful? You don't overreact, you don't underreact. That was one of the highest. But contentment was, uh, you know, learning how to be satisfying, sufficient, you know, and to learn to deal with things. Uh, and the, you know, the antidote for a successful life. How do you want to be successful? So, my question today is God enough? Is God enough? Or does it take God plus? something to make us happy. Paul's talking to Timothy. I love Timothy, especially as a pastor, because uh, we can learn a lot from older people, can't we? Or we should be. My problem is I never listen to it. You know, we can learn from other people's mistakes. There's a lot we can learn. And Paul's been in the game a long time. He's been discontented. He's been content. And he's been shipwrecked. He's been beat. He's, you know, all kinds of, can you imagine, all these things he's been through. Now he's an older man, he's raising up a little grasshopper, a little disciple named Timothy, and he's trying to help Timothy learn uh, from his mistakes and impart to him some tools. Uh, Timothy's full of tools on how to live, uh, to, to proactive things. He said, hey, Timothy, let me, let me let you in on this, let me let you in on this. Let me, you know, you're going to have to have, keep your faith, you're going to have to, you know, stir up the gift, you're going to have to. You know, do all these different things. But here he says, uh, but godliness, that's our word for piety, godliness actually is a means of great gain when it's accompanied by contempt. Paul says you're a pastor. You've been ordained. You're, you're growing. That's awesome. Welcome into the gospel. Got your lawyers, your doctors, but you've chosen to be in the God. Wow, that's an amazing pursuit. Let me tell you something. I've been there, done that. There's going to be some times where you're going to need some tools because there's going to be some time when, uh, you know, this great, amazing ministry that you're involved in, your pursuit of godliness, that's a high, admirable, noteworthy quality attribute to, to have is to be pursuing piety, being a godly man, Christ-like. No better thing. But at the same time, as you're pursuing it, there's something else you're going to need to know. There's going to be times where you get discontented. There's going to be times where you ain't popular. You got to learn how to deal with that. There's going to be times when you're not happy, you got to learn to deal with that. There's going to be times you're ready to throw your keys down and quit. You're going to learn how to deal with that. There's going to be times where you're, you know, your car is broke down, and you know you're going to have to learn how to deal with that. Well, but Lord, I gotta go. You know, well, I mean, you gotta get the car jump first. And okay, there's gonna be times when your health is not good, and you know, people are wanting to fire you. You're unwelcome. You're, it's not convenient. And you know, there's gonna be times where you're gonna have to do that. So as you're pursuing this wonderful guy, a lot of the good things. But at the same time, uh, remember that that godliness is a means of great gain. It's a high achievement. It's a very noteworthy thing, but it has to be accompanied with contentment. Godliness and contentment are like Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. 
tango and cash. But they have to work together. I can be suing, pursuing ministry and all that, but, but if I can't uh, deal with uh, you know, being lonely, how can I focus on people? If I can't accept the fact that I'm not making the money that I need to be making, how can I focus on people? If I'm worried about what people think about me, and I'm unpopular, then how can I focus on things? So as I'm pursuing God, I've got to learn to accept things as they are, the way they are, and the way to where I'm going. I'm going to have to learn how to pray that, Lord God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I can't change, the urge to change things that I can, wisdom and other difference. Where are we at in that? Let me deal with this and let me get back into the game because it is what it is. So he says that, you know, so contentment is a word, artero. It means to be sufficient or self-sufficient or to be satisfied it doesn't mean it means to be okay but it means to be well okay well satisfied it refers to an inter attitude or a character quality uh, uh, it means to be filled it means to, to be enough and you go over here to the chinese buffet and you tear it up and make three or four trips and you go oh man i'm so stuck i i got more than enough i don't need nothing don't even talk to me about, I am so good, I so, I'm so satisfied, I don't even need another bite. You know, and that's what this word means. It actually kind of means to shut your mouth. It means that I got nothing to say. You know, tired of running my mouth. So Paul's telling, telling Timothy these different things. So it, it talks about self-sufficient, but we're not talking about independence. We're not talking about run on no, We're talking about uh, a self-sufficiency that is found in, in, in a sufficiency that is found in God. Philippians 4, 19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. People say, oh, well, that's a promise I can hang on to that God's going to take care of all my needs. But, but listen, to, listen to the method of how God promises to meet your needs. You know, it's not your need, it's, it's not your wants and everything, but your need. He says, he says God, my God will give you all, me, he will meet all your needs in Christ Jesus. Like 48 times in the Bible it says in Christ, in Christ Jesus, in a different thing. It's talking about the relationship. That doesn't mean if I'm lonely and I need a wife or whatever, that God's going to promise to meet that need, Lord, you promise you not. But it says that, that that's a need, but I thought I'll meet that need with that in that way, or maybe I won't, and you can find the same needs, the same emotional needs and things met in your relationship with the Lord. That's what the promise is, that whatever, God, God has a way. God's big enough. God's enough. So I can be okay with where I am on the way to where I'm going. Like I say, if it takes God plus something to make me happy, then I've made an idol out of that thing. Are you with me? If it takes God plus money, before I can be content, you made an idol out of money. If my marriage has to be fixed before I can pursue God, then you made an idol out of it. You put that as, as something. So you know, when, when we don't, when we worry, we're not, what it really says is that, God, I don't trust you. I don't think you're big enough to handle it. What an insult. When you're worried, worried, worried about things you have no control over, you keep trying to do it on your own, what, I mean, what does that say to God? God looks at us and goes, man, I think are you stuck on stupid or what? I mean, come on, have you not seen me? Have you not seen my hand? It should be God equals contentment, happiness, period. My secretary years ago said to me one day, he says, she's an old woman dying of cancer. He says, she's a grand, 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 you know, for healing. Uh, it's, it's horrible to see her just die, you know. He says, David, God said to me in my journal, when he said to me, and she, I can just see her now. She's so beautiful to smile. She, she just looked up and she goes, am I not enough? God was telling her in her quiet time, am I not enough? You know, can you be okay with not being healed and having cancer? Can you still worship? Can, can you still serve, serve me? Can you still give glory to God even though that thing's not there? Am I not enough for you? Let me tell you something. Until God is enough, Nothing else will really satisfy. Until God is really enough, nothing. There's always going to be something. Okay, we're when and then people. When I get more money, then I'll be happy. When I get married, then I'll be happy. When I get divorced, then I'll be happy. 
when my marriage is fixed, and I'll be happy. When the kids get out, then I'll be happy. When I get new windows, when, and there's always going to be something. we got to learn to be okay with where we are and the way we're going. I remember going through this. I was a sexual addict, had problems, and, you know, 23 years, I'm still single. You know, who would have thought? It's been a difficult thing. I remember years ago when, when, uh, when I first went into ministry, God says, if I need you to be single for a while longer and all that, you know, would you be okay with that? And I said, yeah, Lord, I'm in ministry now. We're good to go. <laughs> and 23 years later, yeah, I'm just being real, Joe. Can I just be real? Yeah. Finally, the Lord says to me, after 27 years, one day, he said, David, he said, what if I want you all for myself? I said, well, then that's going to be a problem. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, Do you know who I am? Do you remember, Lord? And I've been riding on you know, needles here for years and years, you know, and it ain't happened, it ain't happened, and your grace has been sufficient, it's been enough, it's been good enough, and the Lord said, what if, what if I was to want you all for myself? What if I needed you to stay single because you could be of greater good to the kingdom of God? Will you, will you do that for me as a gift? And I said, well, Lord, that's going to be tough, but you know what? If that's what you need, then that's what I want to do. So I didn't hear back from him, and it's, you know, it's still been... But anyway, I took that. Eventually, I kept wrestling, wrestling, wrestling for years. And I said, Lord, this is crazy. So, two things need to happen here. I'm telling the Lord this, okay? You need to get up off of it and do something. And, you know, so I quit struggling with this, you know, being alone and the feelings and emotions and all that and the loneliness and all that. Or you need to give me the gift of celibacy. I said, you promised me. He gives us the desires of my heart. You know the desires of my heart better than I do. This may not even be a good thing. So I started really, really praying. I said, Lord, the better prayer is, Lord, may me be content whether I do or I don't. Help me to learn to find this inward sufficiency, this being well, not just okay, but I want to be well okay. I want to be genuinely sad. I want to be genuinely content. I don't have to wrestle with this thing. So either you bring somebody or you give me the gift of contentment and then the better one, Lord, is if it's not meant to be, then I'm giving you this back to you as a gift. My gift is that I've been, I want to give it back to you as a gift. I give it to you, so give, will you give me the gift of celibacy? And I don't know what it was, but it was about a year ago. Things just changed. You know? To be honest with you, knowing me the way I am nowadays, and all, it's probably better, <laughs> better to I remain as fault. But anyway, it doesn't matter. I've not been set free. 23 years now I've been sexy pure and, and now it's it's just like Lord if that's a good thing for you that's up to you you pick her out because my picker's broken I said I need to move on and do what you need to be so I'm okay today finally 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 I've learned over years and years and years to be okay now Paul says in Philippians 4 go there Paul's an old man now, Philippians. In Philippians, the context of the background and history of this thing is that Paul's, uh, you know, he's, he's been out in ministry. And uh, the churches haven't been taken care of. He's been preaching, 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 but they're not giving them a little pulpit money or whatever, you know, real money or whatever. So yeah, that's, where, that's where that, you know, can't, you know, or you to muzzle the ox while he's threshing. That's where that thing came from. You know, a laborer is worthy of his wages. And so he had a good point. But he said, look, I, you know, either way, you know, if, if I'm preaching the gospel and that's my job, you should be, and you're getting fed, then, you know, you need to pay me. You know, I mean, if I'm eating a Whopper at Burger King, I need to pay. I don't eat at Wendy's across the street and go over to Burger King and pay. You know, so I need to pay where you play. You know, where you're being fed. You need to, you know, if this is where you're being fed primarily, then uh, my thinking is this is where you need to put your, you know, money back in, whoever it is. So anyway, he's going through all this, but he said, hey, uh, let's just turn this thing, let's look at this thing from a different perspective. Verse 10, he says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last finally you have received or revived your concern for my financial needs. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you like the opportunity to, to give. So he says, okay, whatever, we'll take the high road. You, you haven't been given back to me because you didn't really have the money and you lacked opportunity, but now you're starting to show concern. So I appreciate that, but let me tell you about me. 
and uh, where I'm at. He said, not that I speak from one. Now, I'm not coming from a position or an angle with an attitude because I've arrived. I've learned uh, a secret to be content in whatever circumstances I find myself. I have learned the word amplified says to be satisfied to the point where I'm not disturbed or disquieted or disquieted in whatever state or position or circumstance I find. I don't get wrapped around the axle. I don't get bit out of shape. I got bigger fish to fry. I got bigger things. So I'm not talking about money that, that I, I know. In other words, I know God's going to take care of me. I know he's got this. Okay. But I'm just bringing out a point. This is the way it should work. But if you don't, that, whatever. You know, my, my sufficiency is in God. God's going to take care of me. You know, if you don't pay me, then he'll send me down to the river and I'll catch a big four pound bass and he'll have money in, in his gut. And now I'll get him. And, or I'll send some ravens and, you know, uh, drop some bread or I'll come water out of a rock or go with me. So he says, I don't speak from a, because I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances. He says, I know, I know, I know how to get along with this life. It is what it is. I know how to deal with life. I know how to deal with you know, high anxiety. I know how to get along with humble beings. I know how to a base is the word. I also know how to live when I'm in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled, <coughs> of going hungry, both of having an abundance and suffering need. The Amplified says, I, I have learned. In any and all circumstances, the secret of being in every situation <coughs> to be well fed, whether hungry, having sufficiency and enough to spare, <coughs> giving me everything that I want and what I need. What, what Paul's basically saying here, he says, look, I've got, I've finally, <coughs> finally, <coughs> I've been in ministry. I've learned that, yes, I, you know, these people are going to give money. There will be seasons where they're giving money. Money will be coming off. But, but there's times where it's, there's going to be, it's not going to be so good. So if I get a paycheck, I don't get a paycheck. I know God is going to pay me. Take care of one way or another. When I'm popular or when I'm unpopular. When you love me, when you don't love me. When I'm fat, when I'm skinny, when I'm smart, I'm intelligent. When it's, un, when it's convenient, when it's ink. Whatever, sir, whatever situation I find myself on this planet, he said, I've learned to be okay. He said, because I've found contentment. I've learned how, the word learned is, is the word school, or to be educated or initiated, refers to a process. Okay, you go in and you, you take Adam's you know, arithmetic, and then you make it to algebra, and then you make it to calculus and physics, and it refers to a place where uh, you uh, go through an internship, you get initiated, and next you become a teacher. You've been schooled, you've arrived, you've got your diploma, you've learned everything you need to do, and now you can look to me as, as the schoolmaster of mathematics. Paul says, man, I've been on the street a long time. You know, Paul was mentioned single, do you realize that? I don't believe in all that today, but i got a whole sermon on, on Paul's struggles about being a single man in ministry out there, okay? Paul says, I've been single, I've been lonely, I've been tired. People stone me to death. I was shipwrecked, beaten, seven, you know, all these different times I was uh, received the lashings of the, the Romans, and you know, I've been there, done that. I've been, he said, I, I've been, I've gone through the school of hard knocks. He says, I want y'all to learn. I appreciate you wanting to do that, but he said, let me let, tell you about something bigger than that that y'all can learn too. Regardless of whatever you do, whatever, I've, this is the way I live my life. I've learned to be, the word means to shut your mouth. That means I've got to put where I quit whining and complaining and moaning and moaning. Lord, you got this. Lord, zip. I'm going to let my gator, Lord. I know you're in control. Don't know how. Don't know when. But I'm okay with where I am and where I'm going. You promised to meet my needs in the relationship. So I'm going to abide in the relationship. I'm going to carry on with the gospel. Do the things I need to be. And God's going to take care of me. That's simple. Then he goes on and says, verse 13. Awesome. Refrigerator. Everybody. Circle this. Because I can do all things through him 
or because of him, because of this tranquil, this inner serenity, this disposition that I'm in. Despite the externals of all the external things going on, I, I've got needs, I've got concerns, the externals, it is what it is, but internally that is where I find my sufficiency in my relationship. Despite that, what I see, feel, and think, I've got an inward disposition that, that is all is well with my soul. How many of you have heard that? It's all is well. You see, all is well. It's all good, baby. Yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, getting a little fat, losing some teeth, got some arthritis, I'm a little skin, whatever. It's all good, baby. God's got this. God's in control. What do I need to worry about? I was thinking about buying this t shirt. How many remember Alfred E. Newman? The old young one. Anyway, he was a character, cartoon character that he would be going through life. A bomb would blow off up over here, and a car would crash, and he'd be going like, what me worry? What me worry? What me worry? Yeah. He didn't worry about nothing. But really, in reality, we should be cruising through life saying, oh, that's a bummer, bummer, but what me worry? What, what, why do I need to worry? I got God that created the universe that cares about the birds. He cares about the flyers in the field. Two, two, one, a bird falls out of the nest. He sees them. Pastor Dave shoots him with the BB gun. He sees that. So maybe he's mad at me. I don't know. But it's all good. So he goes on and says, hey, let me tell you. I've learned that secret of being okay. Regardless, I can do all things through him or because of him who strengthens me. Listen to the amplifier. I have strength for all things. All, all, all. Every circumstance, every city. In Christ, in my relationship. Because, why? Because he empowers me internally. <clears throat> I'm mad living here a little. <clears throat> I am ready, baby, for anything. Equal to anything that can be thrown at me. Why? Because he is infusing me. <clears throat> it refers to a continual <clears throat> process. He's continually infusing me with an inner strength or an inner attitude that he's working me. It's a, it's a contentment that I'm okay regardless. <clears throat> I am self-sufficient in Christ's sufficiency. He said, man, i got like this power plant in me. You know, I don't have to charge it. I don't have to plug it in. You know, I, I, well, in one sense, I, I, I have to recognize it. I have to stay tapped in, but it's infusing me. It's breathing God's DNA. It's breathing his energy, his life. He's empowering me. As the world outside is decaying and, and going to heck in a handbasket, inside me there's another thing going on where God's contentment is producing in me an ability to be okay. He says, I can do all things through Christ. So I've learned. So let me ask you a question today. Have you learned? Have you learned? Are you content? Are you okay? Are you okay with where your marriage is on the way to God fixing it better? Are you okay with being single? Uh, in case he, until he brings it or in case he doesn't. Are you okay with guys making seven or eight bucks an hour until you get a bigger one? Are you okay with not being healed the way you need? Can we be okay with where we are on the way to where we're going? Maybe today you're not okay. Trinity prayer says, uh, let's just focus on God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things that I can, wisdom to know the difference. When you learn to live one day at a time, enjoy one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as you did this sinful world as it is, trusting that you'll make all things good, if I but surrender to your will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy for you in the next. A little verse quick and then I'll be done. Ecclesiastes 3.11 I think says that God has, uh, has an appointed time for everything. He has made everything appropriate in this time and he has set eternity in our heart. Think about that. Let me tell you the reality, folks. This world's a mess. It's simple. It is what it is. It's not going to change a little bit. Bombshell's theory says I can't change life and people by direct action. I can try to, but I can change myself in the way I deal with it. As I change myself, when I go back into the game, change, people look at me and my attitude, and they say, well, if he can change, then I can change. If he can let it go, then I can let it go. That's what we need to be doing. What that basically says is that now that we're born again Christians, God has wired eternity, heaven, in my heart. My real home's in heaven. 
I've gotten to now where I'm, I'm seated with God in the heavenly places. Right now, I'm seated with God in the heavenly places. I'm here preaching at the same time, seated with that. I got to the point now where I'm not even enjoying watching the Gators play, which is not that bad anymore. I don't even like fishing. I'm just not enjoying things because I'm in, I, I enjoy spending time with God. That's what I want to do. I can't wait to get up in the morning and have my quiet time. That's the benefit, benefit of being single, man. I can come and go and do whatever, stay up to two in the morning, read the Word, take a nap, whatever I want. It's, it's, it's an awesome I'm okay. If God brings that, it'll be icing on the cake now. But it's okay if he doesn't. But that's what he says. He's put eternity in our heart. We need to, this is why it's in the serenity prayer. That's like uh, me having a VW car with a 747 engine in it. You know, eternity. I can never, what I'm saying is that we'll never be happy. All the time. That's just the way it is. Life, that's reality. Get over it. Wake up. Get in the real world. It is what it is. I can't change it, but I can change myself. God has wired me, wired me. For eternity. I know that one day God's coming to get me. And then I won't have to worry about cars. I won't have to worry about this. I won't have to worry. Talk about genuine contentment. Then I'll be supremely happy. So God grant me the ability to be uh, reasonably happy now. Knowing that one day I'm going to have it going on. Supremely happy for you in the next. Okay. Today's this altar is open. Maybe uh, you're uh, been out of shape, wrapped around the axle. OCD kick in. Maybe you just need to come up here and let it go and give it to God, turn it over. Let the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this altar is open. We need the Lord, He's there for you.